Let's bow our head for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here this morning with open hearts. We are praying this morning that you will fill our vessels and you please be with us in this morning. Bless Pastor Pete in his sermon and also bless everybody that is here that has come to listen to your word. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Everybody sit down please. This beautiful morning, we would like to welcome everybody to come and join join us, praising our wonderful God. Please feel welcome, feel at home, and that goes to every family here this morning and also to our viewers on TV. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. My name is Sarah. My name is Alan and we are going to lead you in our call to worship, found in your bulletin. I'm going to be the fine print, and I'll be leading the congregation. Those who have long looked for your king, now come, welcome him. Even with an perfect heart and in perfect praise, we will do this. Your good Lord can touch you with fire and purge your approach. With reverent fear, we ask our blood to be blessed. take just a moment uh, to share something with you. Obviously, you've seen, it's hard not to see in your bulletin, the uh, flaming green, the fluorescent green page. I, I think if you look at the top of it, it we kind of forget. We forget how much we've done. In three years, $260,000 of necessary renovation and upgrade. And, and we've paid for it in three years. And, and the list is there, and you may go, oh, I forgot that, I forgot that. And it, it really is breathtaking. 
As you know, as the sheet tells you, uh, the one last element that we're really passionate about, that we need to get on, we have to get on, is the sound system. Uh, when Atlantic Union College alumni weekend would happen every year, the first two years I was here, there was always a lady who would approach me somewhere and say, what's wrong with you people? When are you gonna fix this sound system? I'm not kidding, I didn't even know who she was. And I wanted to look at her and say, and when are you gonna write a check? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I actually, in a, in a letter to this week, I, I shared that uh, Paul Harvey, the late newscaster, he wrote a check for $300,000 for the Camelback Church in Phoenix. They got a really nice sound system. He's not writing one for us. It's our, and as you see, this room is, the, this page will describe it. This room is complex with glass, brick, facings, angles. It's an extremely hard room for the science of sound. It really is. You don't just put up big speakers and pump out noise. If you do that, all it does is just reverberate and, and become unintelligible. And it's an extremely difficult room. We have to move forward. Uh, the, the speakers, a lot, the, the soundboard that he's working on up there right now is 30 years old. I think Ulysses S. Grant worked on that. So no, I'm, it's just, you know, it, it, there are parts of it that are dying and dead. Uh, that we've, got, we've got complex problems here. And so it has been a high priority that we do need to move forward for a new sound system. It's just, it, it just is a must be. As you see on the page, the problem is it is coming in at more than we feared, more than we wished. We hoped, we budgeted $150,000. And the reality is we can't get it done for that, not to do it right. And you may think that you know, somebody's going for some Cadillac system here or gold-plated. Absolutely not. This is really solid equipment, incredibly scientifically. I, I've got 20 pages of documentation in my office that just, I don't even understand one word of it, but it's all the science of the complexity of this room, this room for sound, the research that's been done. And so, as a result, uh, our committees have wrestled with this. Our AV team, they put, we've put, people have put in scores and scores of hours on research. We've honed out what we could. We've narrowed down we've, yeah, everything we can. And we still can't make it for 150000 And we hate to tell you that, but it's just reality. It is reality. So, last Monday night, the Projects Committee and the Finance Committee met jointly to say, what do we do? We've got this excellent system, well-designed, that's really going to serve us for years to come, well-designed, but it's more than we thought it was going to be. What do we do? And we don't have enough money to make it happen. Their recommendation was, we've got to go ahead and do it anyway, and we've got to raise a bit more than $40,000. Some of you may think that it's me, and that's fine if you think it's me. I'm going to come around the room to a few of people who are, who've been in, in, you know, just absolutely intrinsically involved in this discussion. And these are people I know you trust. I know you respect them. They are fiscally conservative. They have a passion for the church, but they're not gonna waste a penny. And I'm going to ask them, do you agree this has to be done and it has to be done now? And I'm, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but I'm just gonna come around. Uh, Jim Seeger. People know you, they love you, they respect your fiscal conservatism. Are you convinced that this has to be done and has to be done now? I'm convinced this is probably the only way we can get together and solve the problem. Thank you. He's on the committee. Roger, you're chairman of the Projects Committee. Have you come to the place where you believe this has to be done now? It, it absolutely has to be done now, and we're getting a very good price, and we're getting a solid sound system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric's sitting over there. He's chairman of our Finance Committee. And... Uh, you know, I mean, all of you really respect Eric, and you respect his sensitivity. And I'm going to ask, Eric, are you, I know this has been hard for you. Admittedly, this has been hard for you, but what do you have to say about it? Well, this certainly isn't something that I normally do, but we have spent an inordinate amount of hours on this. I completely agree. This is something the church will need for a long time to come. And we have to do it now. Okay, I could go to any of the any, many board members. Uh, Elaine, you were in the board meeting. Do you agree this has to be done, has to be done now? She's shaking her head yes. We're not thrilled. I mean, I, I wish like everything we could come to say to you that we, you know, everything's fine. But with all the research, all the effort, all the study, these committees were, commit, were absolutely convinced it has to be done. 
And the board last, night, last Tuesday night voted, let's do it, let's raise $40,000 very quickly. There was not one vote against it in the board. It wasn't an easy vote. We took an hour and a half to get there, but there wasn't one vote against it. The people who have researched this inside and out know we have to do it, and more than that, they know we can do it. Now, I've got some good news for you. Since the word went out on, Tuesday, on Wednesday morning about this, we've already received serious commitments. We're not there, we're not there. But we've received serious commitments of people who say, yes, let's make this happen. The dream is that we'll sign the contract this week that you'll see dust flying within two or three weeks from now, and by the end of January, maybe, we'll have a new sound system. But when we have it, we have to be able to pay for it. We have to be able to write the check at that point. And so folks, we're just bringing it before you. I know that you know, many of us are saying, what can we do? How can, how can we step up and, and sacrifice to make this happen? Because it's just, it's the right thing to do. So thank you. Thank you for reading this carefully. Uh, and I just pray that you will capture the sense that uh, this, this wasn't an easy decision. But people that you love and respect, they are absolutely convinced we should do this and we can do this. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Complete possession is proved only by giving. All you are unable to give possesses you. Command those who have plenty in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generously and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they might take hold of the life that is truly life. Our offering today is for the North American Division World Budget and the Adventist Community Service.
Dear Heavenly Father, before you we bring these offerings, hoping that you will accept them and they will be used in a good cause for your honor and your glory. As we give to you, we enrich our lives and we keep treasures in heaven where they really count. Bless us in everything that we do and during this week, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. It is now time for the children's story if the children want to come forward at this time. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing today? Have you ever waited a really long time for something? Are you waiting very patiently for Christmas to come? Oh, it's so hard, especially when you see those presents under the tree, right? You know, as a little girl, I used to go up and shake them. And sometimes, if I was really naughty, I would peel a little piece back on the back of it off, you know, of the wrapping paper. But my parents always figured that out. I don't know why, but they always knew when I had done that. Well, it's hard to wait for things sometimes, especially when you don't see like anything happening or nothing you know, going on. And I have a story to tell you about a very, very special little dog who waited, and his name is Haichiko. And this is his picture. This is his picture. He loved his master very, very much. And every day, he would walk his master down to the train station to get on the train, and his master would go to work at a university and come home. And every time he came home on the 4 o'clock train, that dog would be waiting right at the train station for his master to get off the train. Isn't that nice? He did that for years and years and years. One day, his master went to the train. He got on the train, and he went to work, and something really bad happened. When he was at work, he had a stroke, and he never, ever came home. But you know what? This dog, he came to that train at 4 o'clock, and he sat, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and all the people got off the train, and the train left the station, and his master wasn't there. So he walked home. And you know what he did the next day? He came at 4 o'clock, and the train came into the station, and he waited, and he waited, and all the people got off the train, and he walked home. And this went on for, guess how long? 11 years. This dog, this is a true story, this dog came, and he waited for the 4 o'clock train, and he waited for his master to get off the train for 11 years. Isn't that amazing? And it's kind of a sad story, because his, his master never did get off the train. But there's another a group of people, actually two people in the Bible who we're going to talk about today, who they waited for a long time to see something, and they did get to see it. And that is Anna and Simeon. They waited for baby Jesus, 
and they got to see him. And sometimes it's really, really hard to hold on to hope. And you know, we're waiting for someone to, we're waiting for Jesus to come back a second time. But you know, the good news is, is because we know he came the first time, he's coming back the second time. And even though it's really, really hard to wait for him, and even though there's a lot of things going on, we know he's going to come. So we need to be loyal and faithful, like Anna and Simeon were, and like this dog was for his master. He did it until the day he died. So keep holding on to hope, because we know Jesus came once. He's going to come again. You can go back to your seats. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'd like to invite you to join me today in the prelude to call to worship. And while we are singing, those who have special petition or praises may join us to the front for prayer. At this time, those who are able are invited to need for prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you and enjoy your presence with us at the College Church today. We come to you with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving for your guidance and protection during this past week. We pray that everyone here today, and especially those visiting with us or watching this program through the electronic media, may experience the love of Christ and his presence during our worship. Father, we pray, you, we lift in prayer your faithful servant, Pastor Pate, as he continues to minister with, for this congregation. May you confer your richest blessings upon him and his family. Thank you for his leadership in our church and for the thoughtful and powerful exposition of your word. Father, there are many among us who are hurting either financially, emotionally, or physically. For those, Lord, we pray for your special blessing Put your healing hands on them and grant them the peace to know that you are always in control. With health concerns, we bring to you Sandra, Al, Joan, Cliff, John, Susan, Jimmy, Tommy, Dustin, James, Thor, Regan, Joel, Roger and Regina, Anne, Wayne, and our church neighbors, June, Linda, and Adam. We also remember those that are serving in the military, Robbie, Kelsey, Kim, Stephen, and Brian. Lord, for those who are serving or studying abroad, we ask for a blessing as well. Eric in Bolivia, Joy in Korea, Jesse and Haley in Pala, where Typhoon Bofa left a trail of widespread damage and pop in the populated areas. Please bring comfort to all those affected in this tragedy. Although, and, uh, and through this coming week, and as we approach the holiday season and celebrate Christmas, we praise you 
and give you glory for the wonderful things you have done for us, for life and health, for friends and families, and for the special gift of your son, Jesus. O oh Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may our praise ascend to you as sweet as incense, and may we touch the lives of people around us with your love and your goodness. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
wonderful. Thank you so much. Normally, I don't get to take part in the uh, scripture reading, and we hand it off to somebody else, but there's a reason for me to do to join Ulysses today. That is, I am reading the part of an old guy. And it's sensitive to walk up to somebody and say, would you mind doing this? You're old. <laughs> you know? And since everybody knows I'm old, you know, it's no shame. So today I'm reading the part of a veteran church member whose name is Timothy. Well, good morning. My name is Ulysses, and I'll be interacting with Timothy as a church member named Kenny, who isn't quite as old. Happy Sabbath to you, and my name is Orlando, and I will be serving as your text master for the day. Our living word passage is taken from Luke 2, 25 to 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Hey, good morning there, Kenny. Welcome to church. It's good to see you, Timothy. How have you been? Uh, I admit it. I've been old. Ah, oh, come on. You're not that old. No, nah, you're not supposed to lie on Sabbath, Kenny. Come on. Hadn't we taught you anything around here after all these years? I mean, come on. Years ago in Pathfinders, like 30 years ago, didn't we try to ingrain that into you, that we tried to hammer it into you, that you're not supposed to lie on the Sabbath? Well, you know, you're right. I do remember you and Mrs. Carlson heading up both the Pathfinders and the Juniors at the same time. Yeah, that's true. And wow, she's been gone about 11 years now. And I've been alone for a long time. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Kenny, my young friend, I'll tell you, I, I never thought I was going to live this long. I never thought we'd still be here. I, I just was sure Jesus was going to return before this. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Honestly, I... I never thought I'd get to this point of life. It's, it's kind of hard. Yeah, Timothy, you know, I'm getting towards the age where I know that life just doesn't seem to be getting any easier at all. But you're really doing great for your, age, for your age. You really are. I don't know about that. Sometimes my creaky old bones seem to get the best of me. But, you know, I keep, I keep hanging in there. I'm pretty tough that way. Hey, can I ask you something? Sure. You know, I've just been wondering, have you ever thought about giving up on God and the church and all? I mean, you've lived a long time and gone through a lot. Have you ever been tempted to just junk it all? I never really did. Uh, sure, sometimes life was hard, but you know, the older I got, the more I realized that there's nowhere better. Everything else around me is fragile. I discovered that the only stability I have in life is here, so I keep plodding along hanging on for all that I can. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. May each of us receive inspiration today from his word. In the book of Hebrews, there's a very interesting verse. It says, to each of us is given one life to live, and then the judgment. Of course, there are philosophies of the concept of reincarnation, and historically, you know, Christianity, we don't go down that path. We, we don't buy into that. And, and I, I, I don't know, it's hard not to be a little... You know, if you look at reincarnation, and granted, I come at it from a Christian viewpoint, and all that, but I mean, reincarnation, when you think about it, is... Are you, are you serious, really? Uh, that if, if you don't do so well this time around, next time around you're going to come back as a banana slug? And banana slugs, by the way, live three or four years. They've got about a three. Or, but if in three and four years you could be the best banana slug you know, in the county, maybe the next time around you're going to get a chance too. And, and I know that that's really simplifying and being a bit derogatory about the concept of reincarnation, but... Um, it just, you know, it's bizarre. I mean, think about it. Suppose, suppose reincarnation were true and you came back as a, a vulture. What do you do to be a good vulture? You clean up more dead stuff in the county than anybody else? I, I, it, it, it's, it's, you know, logically, they're just, it doesn't, doesn't make a great deal of sense for how one creature is actually going to attain, so somehow he can prove he deserves to be better. I, 
But the truth is that we have this strange tension, and we've been dealing with this now for three weeks, that Christianity in one area, we do believe in reincarnation. We believe in the ingoing, ongoing incarnation, incarnation of Christ in his people, in his church, with each successive generation. And not just with each successive generation, Christ gets reborn That's in, in this world with hands and feet and heart and, and activity and motive. That, that that's, it's supposed to be his body on earth. But it isn't just with each successive generation. It's with you and me this week and next week and next week that Christ is reincarnated or he is supposed to be reincarnated. Some of this is very strange. I mean, it, it is so alien. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, one time his disciples approached him and they said, Jesus, sometimes you just leave us in the dust. I mean, you know, some of what you say, it's just, ah, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't make it fit together. And Jesus, his, his answer is strange to us. He that hath ears, let him hear. But basically what he seemed to be implying was, you know, if, if you allow your, the Holy Spirit to, to kind of transform your frequency, um, there's, there's the old you know, radio signal stuff where somebody is out there and they've got two walkie-talkies or something like this and somebody's in the battlefield and they're like three quarters of a mile away and they, they've got to get on the same frequency band and, all, and tweak and you get it until you can finally hear the person. Uh, th th there's something about you and I are born in this planet dissonant to not really, uh, that's carnality, that's the theological term. We're, we're born dissonant at a dissonance to the frequency of the universe, to the, the frequency of harmony and, and heaven and, and goodness. We're born at odds with that. Paul says, I am the avowed enemy as I'm born to God. The book of Romans is very strong about that. So uh, we, one day the Holy Spirit, according to our understanding, uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit somehow, guys, somehow breaks through with you and you begin to hope to respond. You begin to get, just capture that first little faint signal of, of God trying to touch your heart and touch your life and, and show you something better. And if you kind of adjust your dials internally saying, I want to hear more of that. I want, to, I, I, I want to be attuned to the frequency that sounds better, that's, that's melodious, it's harmonic, it's peaceful. It's, I, I don't know that signal. I need, to, I need to get honed in on that signal. And the Holy Spirit helps you adjust until finally you're hearing God very well and you become a transformed person. He that hath ears, let him hear. That if your heart is sort of drawn to that there's got to be better than this. And that God's way, you know, it kind of makes sense. If your heart is, it has that inclination, he that hath ears, let him hear. And there are people who are ready. Uh, often we've asked that question, how many shepherds in Luke chapter 2 were out in the fields watching their flocks by night? But the angels did not appear to them. But there was a cluster the angel showed up to this group. Why them? What about them made them receptive and ready to hear what the angel had to say? How, how many philosophers and, and astrologers and pseudoscientists and, you know, were in the east, but they did not make the journey to follow a star? Why did they have a, a radar that was tuned to follow the star. He that hath ears, let him hear. And Pastor Heather already broke the news to you. I'd like you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Luke chapter 2. It really is breathtaking that there were two who stayed with it long term, continuing to try to see the fulfillment and the culmination. Luke chapter 2. Behold, there was, verse 25, a man in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. He was just and devout 
And he was waiting and waiting and waiting for the consolation of Israel. And somehow, God let him know, you just keep hanging on. You're going to get what you're aching for, what you're looking for. It's, it's, you're going to get it. Just hang on. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. He was waiting. You go farther down the chapter. Verse 36. There was at the same time a woman named Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age. She'd lived since the death of her husband for many years. She was now the widow of fourscore and for 84 years old. Uh, it is estimated that the average lifespan in the Roman world was 44. Now, you have to take, you know, that's a little, little deceptive because you have to take into account that there was a lot of infant mortality, you know, and that kind of skews. But for somebody in the world of Jesus to make it to 60 was, they were getting, they were getting really up there. I mean, that was pretty ancient. 84 was nearly unheard of in the Roman world. That was like somebody today making it to, 102, 104, 105. I mean, it was just, it was breathtaking. 84 was old. And she's old. And she kept like that faithful dog, four o'clock, looking for the train. She kept finding herself gravitationally pulled to the temple, just aching for the fulfillment. She went to the temple day after day after day. She served God with fasting and prayer, night and day. And one day, verse 38, just out of the blue, coming in an instant, it says in King James, she was giving thanks to God, speaking to him on behalf of all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And she saw the baby. She saw him. How many priests were in the temple court that day? Busy, going about the ritual, doing the deeds, performing the acts. When, when, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus for the dedication, this little baby for the dedication, how many little babies had gone by that morning already for dedication? Mass production. And surely there had to be two or three or seven or 13 priests who had seen X number of children that morning. And it was just another kid, another shekel, just moving through. When suddenly, an old man, some of them thought that he was a little daffy, you know, because he claimed he was going to hang on till Messiah came. I mean, we all know those kind of people. And all of a sudden, he comes moving across the temple court floor as a man enraptured because his eyes were focused on one child. This little old lady bent and aged that everybody knew to be just a faithful little saint. There's no stopping little Anna Get out of her way. She's a woman on a mission. She's heading toward that little baby. Those who have ears, they get to hear. And they found the fulfillment and they were waiting. We've talked about the concept of waiting in the Bible before. Our Western view of waiting often is impatience sitting there tapping your feet, you know, hoping like everything, the time will pass until, you know, how many more days till Christmas? <clears throat> how many more days till my birthday? That only goes so far. Once you hit about 14, you quit doing that. I'm just, well, maybe 16 when you get a driver's license. I don't know. But anyway, you know, once you hit a certain point, you quit doing that. I'm just telling you. But I, I, our sense often of waiting 
is tied to the concept of irritation and impatience, internal churning. We don't have the biblical view of waiting. The biblical view of waiting is very tied to the biblical view of a word that we also see as a negative in some ways, rest. Rest. A lot of us, we think rest means turn the switch off. Stop the activity. Cessation. And that is not the biblical view of the word of rest. The word rest, better defined in the Bible, is Re recreation, regeneration, renewal, restoration. Sabbath, you are not to just stop doing stuff. It's a day of reconnection. It's a day of re-energizing your life on every level that you can. It's a day of renewal. The land had rest thereabout in the book of Judges and in First and Second Chronicles, it says, rest there. It didn't mean that nothing was happening in the land. It meant the place was at peace so they could do the good work without threat. They could plant their crops and they could build up their defenses. The land had rest. Rest is not sensation. Cessation, I'm sorry. Rest is not cessation. Rest is proactive healing. And waiting can be that too. Waiting doesn't mean you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs in frustration. Waiting means you are taking advantage of the time, of the moment, so that when it is that event, you're ready to light the switch and blast off. You're ready for the moment, whatever the moment is. Waiting is proactive in the Bible. Matthew 25, Jesus said that. He said, blessed is the man whom when the master comes, he looks at his servant and he finds him so waiting. Waiting. Not sitting there going, mm -hmm. but engaged in doing the necessary work of waiting. Anna and Simeon did not hang around the temple all day long just getting moss on the north side. They were engaged in the preparation and the hope and the activity and the prayers and the praising. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24. Know ye not that those who run the race, everybody runs, everybody, everybody's in it. Everyone runs the race, but only one is going to receive the prize. Set yourself to be that one. Set yourself to be that one. As every man strives for the mastery, he becomes temperate in all things. And some people do it just so they can get a gold medal at the Olympics, a corruptible crown. You're looking for something far beyond that, the incorruptible, that which can never be taken from you. I therefore run not with uncertainty, and when I fight, I'm not just swinging at the air, but I keep my body under subjection, lest by any means this effort comes to nothing. This last Wednesday, in our recalibration, it, it was a worthwhile time. We spent time in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the whole issue of spiritual warfare, and I just let me take 45 seconds to, for the rest of you who weren't here. You and I can spend our life down here churning on this level, which is paying the bills, trying to stay out of jail, trying to maybe build up a bank account, 
you know, whatever, fighting off my temptations, fighting with Satan. We can, we can be down fighting, investing our energies on this horizontal level. And quite frankly, that's almost a waste of time. When it comes to the things of eternity, our struggle is not horizontal. When it comes to the things of eternity, the fight is vertical. The wrestling, the engagement, the investment is vertical. If you and I invest ourselves in grabbing the things of God, God will take care of the things of earth. He'll take care of them in his way. Satan, Satan is a defeated foe. God will take care of him if you're investing yourself in Jesus. God will take care of whatever it is you need in life if you're investing yourself in Jesus. And that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean Pollyanna gets to smile and it's roses all the time. No, what it means is you keep investing in things eternal. Keep investing engagement. You're, you're proactively waiting for the day when you can transition from this to that. And when you keep investing yourself in the, in the vertical relationship, in, in grabbing God and knowing God and in, in discovering how to become like Christ, when you invest yourself in that, he will care for the things of this level. Some of the stuff that you thought was important may just flat, you just don't even care anymore. I had a wonderful discussion this week, wonderful discussion with someone who is in this room. They asked me, they said, can I spend a few minutes with you? And I said, yeah. And they said, I won't tell you who it is, but they, they said, I've been really serious about kind of doing church and, and, and coming and getting in, you know, and, and into my Bible for about two years now. And he says, I don't understand it. He said, I, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. And I looked at him, I said, dude, that's, that's, that's what you do when you're a preacher and you get really theological. Dude, it's called new birth. You are a new creature. Of course you don't know who you are anymore because God is making you new. I'm not the person I used to be. Things that used to appeal to me you know, just aren't there anymore. Thing, and I find myself more emotional. I find myself more sensitive. I find myself more engaged. I find myself more fascinated with the Bible. I, I don't even know who I am anymore. Yeah, that's new birth. That's the way it's supposed to be. When you engage yourself in the vertical relationship, the vertical warfare, God takes care of the horizontal. Whatever is the circumstance of life here, he, take, he fixes it. Either the bills get paid, or maybe you don't have as much stuff to have to pay bills on. You know, whatever. Invest yourself in the vertical. We as Christians, we do believe in reincarnation. Just not the kind that gets floated out there out of Eastern mysticism. We believe in the reincarnation that Jesus keeps getting born over and over and over again in people. And in his people, he keeps getting reborn and reborn and reborn. So that even as your cells are transforming and you, what is it? The, some, there's a, a, some, I'd have to, Dick Brown would have to clarify me thus. It's something about that men's cells regenerate more often than women's cells, but that almost every cell in a woman's body is completely regenerated in seven years, and with men it's like five years. I, I, there's, there's some scientific thing to that. Which, by the way, for any of you ladies, uh, if you've been married for 35 years, you've been married to seven husbands. You've had seven husbands because he's completely been recreated every seven years. Sorry about that. Just as your body is renewed through the regeneration of your cells, Christ renews his people from the inside out when we give him a chance in proactive waiting. Let's turn in closing just one last passage. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 22, 
Put off your conversation, which were the former conversations of the old man. That stuff's corrupt. It's wearing out. It's no good. It won't serve the purpose anymore. Those things that have just come off of your natural deceitful lust. Put that stuff off. Put on the new man. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man after God is created in righteousness and holiness. Put on the new man. Anna may have been 84 years old. She was a child of God. Simeon may have been a doddering old guy that some people thought was a little goofy because he kept talking about, I'm going to stay till Messiah comes. He was a son of God. They kept hanging on. They kept waiting and waiting. And they got better at it and better at it and better at it until they saw him with their own eyes. Our closing hymn is hymn number 129. If you looked in the bullet and you say, I don't get it, what's with admiring little Rosa? Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we had a little lady, her name was Rosa Sommerfeld, who attended our church, and she was just this bent little saint, little, little, kind of a goofy little lady, and she always wore shawls, always wore shawls. And uh, she'd pull the shawl up over her head to keep the drizzle off. That's what it does in Portland. I, I never like sweaters and things like this because they get, boy, they're scratchy. But more than that, if you have a sweater in Portland, Oregon, it's, it's always going to smell because, the you know, this stuff smells when it gets wet. But she always wore shawls, and, and little Rosa would always wear her shawls, and she'd come to church, and when the saints would sing... Oh, Rosa, she'd just lift her little face and she would sing at the top of her lungs. And she had a voice that would curl the toenails of the angels. Oh, it was horrible. Oh, and I'm sure in God's ears it was majestic because it was her whole heart. And she just kept hanging on and hanging on. She was so cool. We used to go tobogganing up at Snow Bunny Lodge up on Mount Hood. Rosa was 84 years old, and she'd go with the junior class to go tobogganing till she broke her hip. 
The next winter, she went tobogganing again. Looking back in my childhood, I, I, there were, to me, very few who's, who better embodied, to me, Anna and Simeon. Faithful little saint, she'd walk to church. She lived about three miles from the church, and she'd walk to church every week. And my parents often would try to go pick her up to take her, especially when it was a really sloppy day. And once in a while, she'd let us take her to church. But most of the time, she wanted to walk to the house of God. And until I was off away to college and married and all this kind of stuff, little Rosa was still there, still going to church, still being faithful. And one of the things that she did was she often was knitting shawls and giving them away for people who were less fortunate. I don't know that I've ever met a saint who ever had less than Rosa, but she was always looking out for those who are the less fortunate. In her little way, she was waiting for the consolation, and she would not give up. And we're called to do the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the fact that you have shown us models of people who have learned in patience how to live this life long term for the long haul and not let the temporary whatever deflect us or distract us but to keep our eyes on the fulfillment and the culmination we thank you for Anna we thank you for Simeon we thank you that day after day they kept renewing it in you and we want to know how to do the same we pray in Christ's name, amen.